37 years ago this week, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded during its initial takeoff, killing all crew members aboard STL-51L. This was the single largest loss of life for any space program at the time, and the second only disaster since the Apollo 1 fire some 20 years earlier. On the anniversary of this disaster, I believe it's poignant to discuss the background and outcomes of the mission while remembering those who lost their lives in the pursuit of science. And before continuing, I would like to thank all those that have already subscribed. If you enjoy space content like this, please consider subscribing for more. One of the only six shuttle orbiters built, Challenger was named after the British naval research vessel HMS Challenger that sailed the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans during the 1870s. Her crew made significant scientific contributions in the spirit of exploration. After its first flight in April 1983 in support of STS-6, which saw the first spacewalk of the Space Shuttle program, Challenger quickly became the workhorse of NASA's Space Shuttle fleet, flying six of the next nine Space Shuttle missions in 1983 and 1984. The orbiter additionally launched the first American woman, Sally Ride, into space on mission STS-7 and it additionally was the first shuttle to carry two U.S. female astronauts on mission STS-41G. Even when other orbiters like Discovery and Atlantis joined the fleet, Challenger still flew three missions a year from 1983 to 1985 until its untimely destruction in 1986 during STS-51L. The crew for STS-51L was announced early in 1985. The crew of the Challenger orbiter was made up of Dick Scobie, who would be the commander, Michael Smith as the assigned pilot, and the mission specialists, Ellison Ozunka, Judith Resnick, and Ronald McNair. Additionally, there were two payload specialists, Gregory Jarvis, who was assigned to conduct research for the Hughes Aircraft Company, and Christian McAuliffe, who flew as part of the Teachers in Space project. The primary mission of the Challenger crew was to use an inertia upper stage to deploy a tracking and data relay satellite named TDRSB, that would have been part of the constellation to enable constant communication with orbiting satellites. The decision to launch the Challenger mission was a deadly example of bad business practices and ethics. The days leading up to the launch, the temperatures surrounding the Kennedy Launch Center were predicted to reach record lows. The air temperature was forecasted to drop to 18 degrees Fahrenheit overnight before rising to 22 degrees Fahrenheit at 6 a.m. and 26 degrees Fahrenheit at the scheduled launch time of 9.38 a.m. This temperature range was well below the accepted values for a known risk concerning the Space Shuttle Solid Rocket Booster O-Rings. I do have to take a moment to elaborate on the Shuttle Solid Rocket Booster O-Rings. Morton Thiokol, the O-Ring providers, and NASA engineers began discovering that there were concerns about the tolerances between mated parts. A 1977 test showed that up to 0.052 inches of joint rotation occurred during simulated internal pressures of a launch. The first occurrence of an in-flight O-ring erosion occurred on the Wright SRB on STS-2 in November 1981. It was discovered that suit was migrating past one of the primary O-rings within the SRB, causing an unreliable seal. Through the analysis of STS-41D and STS-51C, the coldest recorded launch at the time of 62 degrees Fahrenheit, it was determined that there was a proportional relationship between the temperature and the loss of flexibility in the O-rings. As the temperature decreased, the O-rings became less elastic and allowed more bypass through. Beginning in July 1985, Morton Thiokol ordered redesigned SRB casings, with the intentions of using already manufactured casings for the upcoming launches, until the redesigned cases were available the following year. Unfortunately, just a year too late for the ill-fated crew. Okay, so back to the launch of STS-51L. The night before the launch, knowing temperatures would be below freezing, Morton Thiokol employees Robert Lund, the Vice President of Engineering, and Joe Kilmister, the Vice President of the Space Booster Program, recommended against launching until the air temperature rose to more normal levels. Being outranked, Morton Thiokol leadership changed their opinion and stated that the evidence presented of the failure of the O-rings were inconclusive at the time and that there was a substantial margin in the event of a failure or erosion. The flowdown answer from Morton Thiokol to NASA and subsequently NASA to the ground crews was eventually a go for launch. After a few hours on the ground dealing with ice delays, Challenger was cleared to launch at 11.38 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with an air temperature of 36 degrees Fahrenheit. We have main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff. 
liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roger roll, Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Immediately upon takeoff, it was clear something had already gone wrong. Beginning at approximately 0.678 seconds through 3.375 seconds after launch, gray smoke was observed near the strut towers attached to the solid rocket boosters. It was later determined that these smoke puffs were caused by joint rotation in the aft field joint on the right hand side of the SRB at ignition. The cold temperature in the joint had prevented the O-rings from creating a perfect seal. Rainfall during launch prep had likely accumulated within the field joint, further compromising the sealing capability of the O-ring. Beginning at approximately 58.788 seconds after launch, a second plume of gas near the right solid rocket booster was becoming visible. The high aerodynamic forces and wind shear likely broke through the oxidized O-ring, allowing a flame to propagate through the joint. Within one second from when it was first recorded, the plume became well-defined, and the enlarging hole was causing a drop in the internal pressure of the solid rocket booster. The space shuttle main engines pivoted to compensate for the booster burn through, which was creating an unexpected level of thrust on the vehicle. All the while this leak was growing and propagating within the liquid hydrogen tank, the crew and flight controllers made no indication that they are aware of the vehicle flight anomalies. At approximately 68 seconds after launch, the Capcom flight controller informed the crew that the space shuttle main engines had throttled all the way up to 104% thrust. In response, Commander Scobie replied, Roger, go at throttle up. And this was the last communication from Challenger on the air-to-ground loop. We'll throttle down to 65% uh, shortly. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance. At roughly 46,000 feet and traveling at Mach 1.92, shortly after the last call down to Houston, the combination of forces eventually caused a total systematic failure and explosion of the shuttle. The abrupt changes in dynamic loading caused the Challenger orbiter to break apart into multiple pieces, including the wing, the space shuttle main engine sections, and the crew cabin. At the time of the explosion, the crew cabin reached an ultimate height of 65,000 feet, and the crew sustained G loads ranging from 12 to 20 Gs. At least some of the crew were alive, and at least briefly conscious after the initial explosion and breakup. Mike Smith's portable emergency air pack, which was located behind his seat, was most likely activated by one of the two mission specialists. There have been countless theories on the survivability of the accident, but according to a report from Joseph P. Kerwin, Director of Space and Life Sciences at NASA, he determined three total conclusions. One, the cause of death of the Challenger astronauts cannot be positively determined. Two, the force to which the crew were exposed during the orbiter breakup were probably not sufficient to cause the death or serious injury. And three, the crew possibly, but not certainly, lost consciousness in the seconds following the orbiter's breakup due to in-flight loss of the crew module pressure. While the orbiter was still falling out of the sky, horror was just now beginning to dawn upon the flight controllers. At approximately 89 seconds after launch, Video of the explosion was projected onto the small cathode TVs within mission control. Flight Director Jay Green ordered that contingency procedures be put into effect, which included locking the doors, shutting down the telephone communications, and freezing computer terminals to collect data from them. Flight GC, we've had uh, negative contact, lost the downlink. Okay, all operators, watch your data carefully. Flight final until we get stuff back. He's on his cue card for abort modes. Flight GC, negative downlink. Copy. Flight Fido. Go ahead. RSO reports vehicle exploded. Copy. 
Copy. Fido, can we get any reports from recovery forces? Stand by. Following the disaster, despair enveloped the nation. People all across the world, and even children in schools, watching a blink of an eye as Challenger exploded out of the sky. Today is a day for mourning and remembering. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the shuttle Challenger. We know we share this pain with all of the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. In the wake of one of the worst tragedies of modern spaceflight, NASA revamped a number of programs. In response to the Challenger Commission, the solid rocket boosters were redesigned and the safety standards were subtly improved. NASA also reduced the critical items list of the space shuttle and created a new Office of Safety, Reliability, and Quality Assurance. The brave men and women who chose to fly in the space shuttle program all understood the risk of going into space. Advancing humanity is no simple feat after all, and the pursuit of science is one of the world's greatest passions. However, Challenger's crews deserved, as much as anyone else, dignity. Their deaths can be attributed directly to a culture that valued visible success over safety. Driven by time and pressure, a progressive system of ignorance took hold of NASA and eventually cost the lives of all seven crew members aboard STS-51L. It's truly imperative to share this kind of story even 36 years later, not only to mourn the lives lost, but as space programs become more elaborate and widespread, there are a whole new generations of engineers that may not fully grasp how their actions may one day affect the lives of another human being. If you have other recommendations for video ideas, please let me know in the comments. And again, please consider subscribing for more space content.